Hi everyone, my name is Hugh Breslin and I'm a design engineer working for a microchip. Today I'm going to be talking about developing for Polar Fire SOC. So what we're going to cover, um, hopefully uh, by the end of this session uh, I'll have lived up to the tagline of less complicated than it seems. But in depth what we're going to try and cover is the functionality of the application and the monitor cores in Polar Fire SOC. Uh, we'll have a look at how to develop for bare metal, and I'll kind of briefly touch on Linux as well. And then we'll have a look at how to develop for an FPGA. So my hope is that by the end of this presentation, uh, you'll have an idea of how to develop for Polar Fire SOC, and it won't seem as complicated as it might initially seem to get started with a new architecture. So to get started, uh, just briefly, let's have a look at what is Polar Fire SOC. It's the world's first RISC-V based SOC FPGA. So we've had Polar Fire um, FPGAs around for a while now. It's a very good family, it's doing quite well. And if you have a look at the image on the right hand side now, um, you can see I've got the FPGA and the SOC. So when we talk about Polar Fire, and um, that's our FPGA fabric. And if you bought a Polar Fire FPGA, you're just going to get one whole blue block um, with all the programmable logic built into it. But with Polar Fire SOC, we've added on uh, the SOC portion in the top right by taking out some of the, the FPGA fabric and putting in um, our microcontroller subsystem, uh, which contains our application and monitor cores and some peripherals and that then can interface into the FPGA fabric. So there's kind of a running myth that, or running line that FPGAs are quite complicated. And with what we've produced with Polar Fire SLC, it's not actually that complicated at all to get started in trying to do your development, whether it's hardware development for the FPGA fabric itself, or software development um, in bare metal or Linux for the SOC MSS portion. And really what we've ended up with is a product that's quite dynamic because you have the power of the FPGA and its fabric and you have the power of the SOC. And when you put the two together, you get a really impressive system. Well, this is, as we said, the world's first RISC-V based SOC FPGA. But what we've noticed in the grand scheme of things is that the RISC-V side of things has been invisible because it just works under the hood. And when it comes to building your software, you'll build with a different compiler to target RISC-V, but you're still gonna write C code. Or if you're writing a Linux application, that's going to be written in relatively the same way. Um, so RISC-V as a transition is really not that difficult to make. Um, we It's very hard to actually notice the difference when you're taking advantage of Polar Fire SOC. Um, and what I hope by the end of this presentation is that you'll see that we uh, can't be completely invisible um, from what we have to implement as microchip, but we can be transparent. And I think we've really done a very good job of staying transparent in everything that we've done, which allows users then a lot of flexibility and understanding to do what they need to do. So let's have a look at the product in a bit more detail. And starting off with our MSS. So we have five cores in the microcontroller subsystem. One of them is a monitor core. So that's a Sci-5 E51. And as it goes, there's nothing kind of architecturally that says it can't do anything. It's just not as powerful as the other application cores. And we have four application cores, which are Sci-5 U54s. So the application cores that boot up and run Linux or your bare metal or ORTOS applications um, and other worker cores. And the monitor core can keep an eye on the system. It can boot it up. It can restart a heart that might have crashed. Um, and it can provide some system services between the hearts. So we'll have a bit more of a look at them in detail in a minute. And then as well as the cores, we have peripherals built in. And I've just listed off a few here. So like we've UART, uh, USB, we've CAN, we've GPIO, uh, Ethernet, DDR, uh, we've MMC. There's tons of stuff actually uh, built into the MSS 
that are available as peripherals to all of the cores. So that's something that's really useful. And then as well as that, uh, you have your FPGA. So the Polar Fire FPGA fabric with its programmable logic. Uh, you've got Serdes, you've got PCI, uh, you've got math blocks you can take, take advantage of. Uh, you've got SRAM available through the fabric. So there really is quite a lot. Um, and as I've said, when you combine the two of them, the MSS and the FPGA, you end up with a lot of freedom to develop for what you want. Um, and you end up with a lot of flexibility uh, because you can instantiate additional components in the FPGA fabric and use them from the MSS. Or if you were primarily using the FPGA fabric, you can offload some work into the MSS. So there, you can do quite a lot of what you might want to do. So let's look at the cores in a bit more detail. And I'll start with the application cores, uh, so the U54 hearts. So we have four U54 cores. <clears throat> and what's quite interesting is you don't have to use them all at once. You can use uh, several different configurations that you can think of. So let's say you just wanted to run one application on Polar Fire SOC. You can target a single application core. You could target two of them, three of them, or all four of them if you wanted. But then another use case could be someone wants to target a single application at one core and another at three cores. So a one plus three situation where the, the single application could be some crypto application that's running and then Linux is running on the other three cores. So we can, you can support one plus three. Uh, you could do two plus two, uh, two cores and one core and one core or four individual applications running across uh, four distinct hearts. So that's quite interesting. You can um, do a lot with it, but how do you actually configure the system so that an application is running on one heart and not another heart? And how do you have another application in, independently running on, let's say, three of the hearts? It's actually not that difficult. And this is um, where us being transparent kind of ties into it. So throughout our how, we have several very handy to use defines that are actually incredibly powerful. So we have these two here that I've uh, shown, which is the MPFS how first heart and the MPFS how last heart. Um, and you can see the first heart is set to zero and the last heart is set to four. Well, with the last heart value of zero, um, we basically have a list of cores where the E51 is heart zero, which is the monitor core, and each of the U54s uh, starting at one up to four are listed off. So it goes E51 as heart zero, U54 underscore one as heart one, U54 underscore two as heart two, and so on. So with these defines configured the way I have them at zero and four, all of the hearts are going to be used by this application. Um, but let's say we changed the first heart value to be two. Well, that means now that the E51 and the U54 underscore one are no longer going to be touched by this application. Uh, if they tried to run code uh, from the application, let's say they went, they restarted to the reset vector of this program, they'd just be put into a wait for interrupt loop and um, they wouldn't actually run any code. So those two cores are eliminated with the first heart value of two. And then we have an application that's going to run on three of our U54 cores. And if we wanted to limit an application to just run on a specific heart, like let's say the first application core, U54 underscore one, we just set our first heart defined to be one and our last heart defined to be one. And we've configured the system so that we have an application that's only going to run on one application core. And if you set the first heart to a value of two and the last heart to a value of four, you have an application that's going to run on three of the cores. So that is changing two lines um, of the software configuration, which actually completely reconfigures the way applications are going to run in the system. But then as well, you might want to target a specific heart. So you've got some application code that's going to run across three cores. How do you make sure that the code that you're writing is always going to execute on a specific core? But this again is actually not too difficult to do. Because what we've done is we've um, set up our projects so that if you provide a function named after the heart, so targeting the first application core in this case, which is the U54 
underscore one. If you provide this function, uh, when the heart, the heart starts up, it'll jump to this and start executing code from it. So this is our u54 underscore one main function. Now what's quite handy is that if you don't provide a function for this, you don't have to necessarily disable the heart. Uh, we've provided a weekly linked function for each of the hearts in the system. So if we left our first and last heart defined, so our application can use every core, but we don't provide a function for u54 underscore four, it'll just end up in its weekly linked function and be put into wait for interrupt mode. So it's quite clear uh, what's happened. You can actually step through our startup code and very easily see all of this happen. Um, but by changing a few defines that are very easy to see and all listed off in certain files, you can reconfigure the way your system starts up. And if you want to target specific application hearts uh, to execute some code, that's also quite easy to do uh, just by using the functions that we provide. And in terms then of your development, if you wanted to do some bare metal development, we have the soft console IDE available um, for that. And if you wanted to do some Linux development, then write your own apps, or if you were putting some custom logic in the FPGA fabric and you wanted to um, write a driver for it, we provide the Buildroot SDK and the Yocto build system through GitHub. So you have access to them when it comes to writing some software to run on our application cores. But I just want to briefly talk about the monitor core as well, um, which is the E51. Um, and what its purpose is and what it's doing while your Linux application and your um, ORTOS are running together uh, or whatever configuration you have. So the E51 runs the HSS, uh, which stands for Heart Software Services. So the HSS uh, provides you some system services and um, provides you with message sharing. So that's quite useful. And um, so in this setup here on the right hand side, we have a communication layer uh, between our U54 application cores, which is provided by a tool called the Secure Software Messaging Bus, or SSMB. And that allows you to send a message, let's say from U54 underscore one to U54 underscore four, so a message from Linux to the Ortos, and through the HSS. Where let's say, Linux, let's say our Ortos is running some kind of um, crypto program for us or some image processing or um, getting data for us, Linux can use the SSMB to send a message to the ORTOS to tell it to perform a function or vice versa. So that's quite useful. And then the HSS also provides us with our boot. So it acts as a zero stage bootloader. If we have an application stored in non-volatile memory like an SD card or in EMMC, it can start up the system and load the application for us and store it in DDR and then start up the application cores. So it provides quite a lot of, or quite a few very useful services for our overall system when we're running and just before we start up. And then let's just have a look at some development. So we've kind of done an overview of all of our hearts. Uh, what have we provided that lets you get started very quickly with your development? Well, for bare metal, uh, we've created the Polar Fire SOC bare metal library. It's a repository up on GitHub. And in there, we've um, a whole range of examples. So over on the right hand side, I took a screenshot of the um, most recent examples folder. And we have an example basically for each of our drivers. So all of these work in our soft console IDE. And as I said, that's where you go for your bare metal development. And each example project um, will, be will be based on a peripheral driver. And some drivers have multiple projects. Uh, for example, the MMC driver gives you multi-block project or multi-block transfer projects and single block transfer projects. Um, and the main purpose is to demonstrate each of the functions that we provide in the driver. So for UART, we provide uh, an initialization function and a transmit function. Uh, so you'll get examples of how to use them. And if you want, you can just copy and paste from our examples into your own project, and you can use the peripherals that way. So it's a really uh, fast way to get started, and it's a great resource 
be able to use. And Soft, um, Soft Console can build those projects for you. You can debug them running on a hardware target, or you can emulate them as well. Because Soft Console has three node emulation platform from Ant Micro built in. Uh, we have a Polar Fire SOC platform in Renode, uh, along with Icicle Kit board support, uh, which is our Polar Fire SOC um, initial platform. So in Soft Console, you can test out all of these drivers, and you can test them out without even having hardware in front of you. So it is very, very handy. And the final point is that all of these examples are pre-configured for you. So they're pre-configured for the um, Polarfire SLC system, but they're also pre-configured as uh, software projects. So all of the um, RISC-V extensions are targeted for you. The linker scripts are set up. Uh, any build settings for the project are pre-configured for you. Uh, so as a starting point, instead of having to kind of start from a blank canvas and create a new project from absolutely nothing, you can import one of the example projects and the MMUART interrupt project is kind of our go-to one, and I'll show that in a second. And you can import those projects and start developing within them, um, which saves you having to go through kind of all the steps of starting from scratch. So this is a useful uh, resource for kind of learning how a driver works, but it's also very useful uh, to get started quickly. And just to have a look at what we actually provide, in terms of our example code. So uh, I took a snip of some of the uh, example code we provide in our MMUART interrupt project. Uh, so if we just have a quick look through that, uh, up at the top, we initialize our mutex. So you can see how we've set up mutex for our interrupts in folder fire SOC. Then we initialize the UART itself. So we initialize MSS UART zero. Uh, we set up the baud rate the data bits, the parity, the stop bits. So you can literally copy and paste this into your um, your own software project. Then uh, we set up our ORX interrupt handler. So if we get a message sent to the system, we'll get an interrupt and we enable that interrupt. So again, it's very useful. And um, if you want to use um, the UART yourself, and then we demonstrate how to do a poll transmission from this UART and then we also are using, then we also demonstrate how to use the um, mutex and we demonstrate an interrupt driven transmission method. So depending on your different application, what you want to do, um, we've tried to show you all of the different ways you can use this peripheral. So when we've done that for uh, UART is quite an easy one to show, but we've done that for all of our different peripherals uh, that are present in the system. And if we kind of briefly touch into Linux and what we've provided there. Uh, so as I said, we've provided um, the BuildRead SDK and we've also provided the uh, Yocto platform. And in that, what's quite, quite useful is um, you have our full commit history and development history for those platforms. So if you developed your own Linux app that you wanted to add in, um, into the build system or if you developed your own driver for a custom peripheral you've created in the FPGA fabric. You have our full commit history uh, for when we added in to Yocto and Buildroot as we've gone along. So I just had a quick look and I was able to find uh, the commit from when we added in our PCIe driver. So you can see all of the changes that were made to add in that driver. And if you're trying to do the same yourself, um, you can base what you do of the work that we have done ourselves previously. And then finally, let's have a quick look at the FPGA development side of things. So um, in terms of FPGA development, we have the Libro SOC design suite, version 12.5 and above, uh, with support for Polar Fire SOC. So you can use Libro to um, generate reference designs, and also uh, add in and remove from the FPGA fabric. So you can build on top of our out-of-the-box design using our Icicle Kit reference design repository. So um, we've provided this up on GitHub. You can download the repository and run a script in Libro that will generate a reference design for you. 
Um, so this is the reference design that stood when I was recording this. Um, you run the script and you have the entire design that you would find on your icicle kit right in front of you. So if you wanted to add your own peripheral into the fabric, you can um, add on to the design that's already there instead of having to recreate it and try and figure out all of the different aspects of the FPGA, you can just target what you would like to specifically develop for. So that's been a very quick look at our FPGA development. So just to summarize then, uh, what is Polar Fire SOC? Um, so it's the world's first risk five um, risk five based SOC FPGA. And the main point is it's actually very easy to develop for. We've provided you with everything you need to get started, um, along with a lot of examples. And it's highly configurable. So depending on the application you have in mind for it, you can configure it quite easily to do what you need it to do. And then finally, I'd said initially that RISC-V in Polar Fire SOC is actually quite invisible. It doesn't make a huge impact on getting your development going, um, and you don't notice it when you're actually running code. Um, but we ourselves, I said, are transparent. So how are we transparent in what we do? Well, we use um, smart defines or very smartly used defines throughout our code. So you can quite quickly reconfigure Polar Fire SLC as a system and um, by changing one or two lines of code um, by defining or undefining some variables. And then we've also provided you with quite a lot of information. So we've our build systems like Yocto and Buildroot with full board support and platform support for Polar Fire SOC and the Icicle Kit, along with our commit history. So you can see the work we've done um, and how we've done it, which is quite useful for maybe building on top of it. And then we have all of our dr peripheral drivers available for bare metal, uh, along with examples of how to use all of the different features of the drivers. And the final thing that's quite useful is that we provide pre-built images for people who might want to not develop for a certain aspect of the system. So in total for Polar Fire SLC to um, boot Linux, for example, you need an FPGA programming file, you need the HSS uh, to boot up the system, and then you need a payload, which would be your Linux image. Well, we provide people with an FPGA bitstream uh, that also contains the Heart Software Services as a client. So you can program that down onto your board without having to configure anything. And your FPGA part is programmed to a known good state. And you have the heart software services programmed in your ENVM for you. So if you were developing custom Linux images, all you need to do is program your custom build down. And if you wanted to just build or develop for the FPGA and make sure that none of your changes had broken Linux starting up, uh, we provide you with uh, pre-built Linux payloads, um, so you can just program them down, along with our tickle scripts to generate a reference design that will match what we have produced and programmed onto the boards in the factory. So I hope um, that's helped make things a bit clearer. I hope it shows that Polar Fire SLC is very easy to actually get started and develop for, um, and how transparent microchip has been in what it's provided and the different tools that we've used. So thank you all very much.